Welcome back to Cambridge Inside Out. I'm still Robert Winters, and that guy over there is still Patrick Barrett. Patrick Barrett. Wah, 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 wah. So um, I think at the at the end of our last half hour or 27 minutes, as it were, more or less, uh, we you were mentioning some. We were mentioning something about this sort of this uh, contrast between strong mayor and city manager yes. in terms of government, right? Uh, you know, in terms of, you know, certainly when you have a mayor like we currently had in this term who just, when he had ARPA funds just announced, even though I heard zero discussion at the city council, just announced this grand program of what was it, $22 million of direct subsidy to, right. uh, to you know, some subset of people. Uh, but you know, maybe about a couple thousand people, something like that. I don't know how you um, register for the program, but it was I mean, a twenty-two million dollar allocation is no small allocation. No, it's it's a it's a significant allocation, and it would not have happened in that way were it not for the fact that it was it was basically manna from heaven. It was the ARPA funds, you know, that came about because of the uh, the pandemic. And and by the way, city of Cambridge was not the only city in the country. That was basically grabbing ARPA funds and using it to essentially play catch up on every initiative that had nothing to do with COVID they could imagine, right? <laughs> you know, I mean, yeah, we can all agree that that maybe uh, public assistance can be a good thing, but justifying public assistance because there was money there to make up for some of the detrimental effects of COVID never quite added up for me. Uh, well, I, I, well, so. A lip the um is sort of like uh what was the candidate who had the idea of giving a thousand dollars to everybody that was his whole shtick? Oh my goodness! Uh, I'm drawing a total but, blank on his name right now. I mean, it was Ross Perot. It was a sort of a big shot, but I don't think it was Perot. No, it wasn't Perot. It was more recent. It was more recent. He was a presidential candidate. But this, I think, is very similar to that like thought process that simply just giving people money helps them rise out of poverty, and I'm not so sure. I even disagree. I'm not sure I disagree with that, but I was thinking, you know, we're, you're talking about ARPA money and disproportionately affected peoples from the pandemic. The people who were the most disproportionately affected in the pandemic were kids. And this period, if yeah. I had $22 million, I would have given every kid in the, in the entire Cambridge public school system, a $5,000 scholarship to their, to the school or the uh, cheeseburger bar of their choice. Or you take that money, you give it to the high school kids and you say, listen, we are the kids who graduated, the kids who missed their proms, the kids who were spent their junior and senior years in a friggin bubble. Those kids, you say, listen, we we did you wrong. Here's fifty thousand dollars for at least your first semester of school. Does that, does that even pay for a first semester anymore? Um, well, the, that's a that's actually a much more complicated question than you may think. <laughs> well, uh, my, my, my I mean, if it's need, if it's need, if it's one of the elite universities with needs blind admission, you know, actually having money probably would work against you. <laughs> well, I, I, I just, I just think the idea of like give, paying it forward and giving. I remember when we had the kids do their prom at Starlight, and they still had to like socially distance from each other, and they played terrible music. And we were, you know, kid, I actually was at the Ringe recently, and the kids reminded me of how bad that music was, and I said I didn't pick it, but like. You know, you, you 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 invest in our future, I, and I think like the the problem that I have with this program is, again, what happens? And you know, you, you give it, you give a man a fish for eighteen months, and then on the nineteenth month, you have to stop. You, you uh, never thought about a fish, right? No, I I, I completely agree. But I, you know, it's it's interesting, you know, largely because I've been immersing myself for the last. <clears throat> several months in matters having to do with city charter, you know, the history of the city charter from 1846 and even before uh, up until today. And I, th I think I've educated myself a fair amount about it. But, you know, one of the periods you know, that we went through, well, actually more than one, it was really multiple charters where things like political patronage, and that, back then that might have been primarily things like handing out jobs or, or basically putting a person on the city to give them a job during the depression, for example, because the person was in need. 
yeah. you know, and you, and you couldn't just hand out free cash. So what you do is you, you basically just gave them a job. And it, what it did is it completely busted the city budget uh, to the point where ultimately the decision to move toward the plan E form of government, city manager form of government was ultimately uh, to, get up, to get out of this hole we had dug ourselves into in terms of mismanagement, right? Oh my and God. It's, it's, you feel like you feel like history is just it's like coming around the corner to get you. <laughs> it, it is it's definitely coming around the mountain again. And, uh, you know, and so we're in a, you know, and again, it's very hard to, to speak against things like providing housing or providing public assistance or providing w whatever, you know, no one's speaking out against um, any of that. Right. But, you know, the thing is, is that at some point you have to make a you have to connect the dots and see that there are clear political advantages to being the person who doles out the cash or delivers the housing or what have you. I mean, I remember once upon a time, I think it was actually when Jim Browdy was on the council, there was an idea floated um, it's very seriously in this, among city councilors to create what they called an ombudsman position. And the ombudsman's position would be meaning if you have a problem, you know, you know, navigating city government, you just go to the ombudsman and the ombudsman sort of get, fixes things up for you, right? I got news for you, Robert. I've, I've already delegated, I've, I've already taken that position in Central Square. I am okay. the ombudsman. If there's All a right. superhero name for me, I'm the ombudsman. Okay, I, I, <laughs> I like that. We have to put the big O on your chest now, right? But, but here's the thing is that you might think, well, that sounds like a nice idea, right? Mm -hmm. The city council voted it down. In fact, they voted it down almost unanimously. Now, why would they vote down such a thing as something which would clearly help the, the <laughs> residents of the city? Really, I Mr. Barrett, perhaps you can provide an answer. I think I have an idea. So, I, so hear me out. Maybe the city council didn't like it when they had a point person that worked at the city level handling the problems of citizenry and they wanted to make it so that the citizenry had to go to individual counselors to help solve their problems. Am I close? Mr. Barrett, you may go to the head of the class. Yeah! <laughs> that is exactly the point and that is exactly how it played out. The fact of the matter is- uh, That's why they hate me. The, you know, the, a, fr a good friend of mine once wrote an essay Actually, strangely enough, it was about the difficulties in why we could never work our way out of the rent control issue. But, it's, but that's not the point. The point was really that he said that uh, the, the, um, the proponents and the opponents of rent control all benefited from the existence of a problem. You, right? you are jo you're jogging my memory on something that I'm sure you remember. There was an interview with a counselor at the, who was like the deciding vote on rent control. And I believe he said something, and I'm paraphrasing, like it was the worst vote I ever made. And I like, and I think there's like, you have to, you, Mark McGovern actually, despite his hippie leanings, like remembers the time of when Cambridge had no money, you know, when Cambridge was drained. It's hard to imagine now, or hard to imagine going back, but now, rent control, the damage that has been done by rent control in the city of Cambridge is still with us in, in, in rundown buildings and undeveloped areas, underdeveloped areas, uh, antiquated zoning. Um, and it's like, we're, I feel like we're just barely tipping our head up to see the sunlight and they're shoving us back down the hole again. Well, uh, to that point, uh, you know, I remember when I bought my triple decker because, you know, Previously, the owner lived in Medford, and so therefore it was under rent control. But after I bought it, the owner lived in Cambridge and lived in the building, so it was now exempt. Okay, and what happened was immediately I got my first revaluation, and the value of the property uh, jumped. You know, it like tripled <laughs> overnight. The point here being, uh, not that I was thrilled to see a higher tax bill, but that the rent control properties, because of the encumbrance of having the regulation, they were in fact, you know, because of state law in, in terms of market value, they were, they were very depressed. Now, what, do you, what happens if you're a city who back in the early 1980s, especially because of proposition two and a half, um, you, you can't just jack up the, the, the tax levy, you know, arbitrarily. 
and then you have a lot of the residential property is suppressed in value. Mm -hmm. Yet we are a, we are a liberal city that wants to provide programs and assistance of all sorts. Yep. Okay, so there we have a little bit of a problem. Oh yeah, and let me throw in yet one more complicating fact, which is that an extraordinarily high percentage of the city is tax exempt because of universities, government properties, and other nonprofit institutions. Okay, so you know you can't. You can't change that. You can't turn Harvard into taxpaying property, for example, or add the entire MIT campus. You, um, you are a lot of the residential uh, tax base is heavily depressed. You have limitations on it. So what happens? Well, along comes the Tax Classification Act. So it enables you to um, to do two things. One is you could you could classify residential, commercial, industrial and open space and into different categories. And then you could guess what? You could actually skew the tax rates so that you could have commercial property tax uh, paying a significantly higher rate than residential tax rate. Now you're a political person, what do you do? You make a decision, you know, and the city manager makes a similar decision, which is that we wanna be good to our resident taxpayers. Right. So we always keep the residential tax rate low and then necessarily that causes the commercial tax rate to go up high, like two and a half times or something like that. The well, rate. And then that becomes the ultimate cash cow for the city, because now commercial development started taking off like gangbusters, yeah. because that was how we were going to pay the bills. Well, gee, Robert, it sounds like I can have my cake and eat it too. Not only can I as a city councilor, throw my city manager under the bus for promoting all this commercial real estate development and, uh, you know, labs are terrible. But I can also say, well, your residential tax rate is very low and, you know, we take care of our residential owners while not acknowledging the, the actual calculus of all that. So now fast forward to 2023, we're talking about lab bans, rent control, and I, I'm sure Mr. Louis is sitting in his lazy man right now, smoking his corn cob pipe, looking at the fire, laughing because you're you're about to upset a, a balance that has existed for quite some time, and they have no they have no they painted themselves into a corner. They have, by not acknowledging this reality, by not take sort of using a keto politically to turn that into a better outcome, we've made villains of developers. And we've made superheroes of these activists who come from a moral sort of higher, higher ground that say, you know, gosh, you know, maybe, maybe, maybe housing should be free. And maybe we don't need commercial development to pay for it all. And maybe, again, it, I've said this before, if you watch South Park, it goes right back to the uh, underpants gnomes uh, uh, <laughs> methodology for determining the valuation of things and their plan. You know, first you get rent control, question mark, profit. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, that's right. Just to, straight through, that's it, yeah. <laughs> well, it's, it is interesting actually, and uh, another part of the discussion, I think, I believe it was last night up at the city council when they just were mentioned, maybe it was part of the discussion about the AAA bond ratings at the city. Mm -hmm. Uh, again, yeah, yeah and which which and that's an, that's worthy of some discussion as well, by the way. But um, but as part of that, they were acknowledging the fact that the reason why we are still doing okay is it's because of not just development, but specifically lab development. It is lab development right now is a, apparently quite robust in the city, mm -hmm. and in fact is what enables us to have some of the high bond ratings. Right, which enables us to finance. Got some projects. bad news for you, lab fans. Yes, <laughs> that, that that boom is over, my friends, and that and it died about eight months ago. Um, you, you're going to see what's called spec labs fall off the face of the earth. Well, you know, th it's interesting you should say that, and I'm not going to question you because you know far more about this than I ever will. But you, one of the things that I, you, you know, um, I'll make a comment. I'm going to sound a little math geeky here which is that you have to always be a little careful about looking at the averages, 
-hmm. because the, you know, like when people used to talk about the unaffordability of housing or the affordability of housing, they would say, don't you know the average rent is this? And you know, the, what the average rent was oh. or the average housing cost was, was not nearly as significant as how it was spread out. Because if you wanted an affordable apartment once upon a time, you could find it because there was enough spread that there was some maybe not the most beautiful places. But and there still find is. Them. And there still is, right. But, but it, was the, it was the narrowing of that band so that it became much more difficult to find those. Robert, that was the difference. How, how many times has the census man come and have you given them your, uh, your rent rolls? Every, when, when, uh, when, when uh, Redfin calls you, and ask you how much your rent is. Do you tell them? Or have they ever called? Uh, they, they, they have, have ever never called, called me, but if they yeah. did, I would say go screw. That, well, that's my point. Um, the only people who report their rent rolls are institutional landlords. These are your big reads, and they have to, they're required to. So they also, in, in a lot of ways, want to, so they can entice more investment. So if I tell you my rent roll, if I, it's three thousand dollars for a single bed for one bedroom apartment in the city of Cambridge, or I think the latest number I saw was even more than that. That is a load of bull. Well, because actually, the another uh, incorrect methodology. And by the way, I am in no way, and I don't believe you are in any way saying that rents are cheap in Cambridge because they're not. But the thing is, is I would also see them routinely say they would come up with a quote study of grants or, uh, and whatever that was based on um, on listings in the Boston Globe. Sure. Now, seriously, yeah. if you're looking for, you know, the, the better rents, you're probably working all sorts of uh, informal uh, uh, circles of, of friends and whatever uh, to sort of find out about these things. You're not necessarily taking things and finding the best deals by just looking in the newspaper. Robert, I've had, I have an undisclosed amount of rental property in the city and other parts in other cities. And I, the last time I listed an apartment was probably 2012. I haven't, I have, I, 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 right. it's, all, it's, it's either word of mouth. Um, I have tenants who are typically very long-term tenants and, or when they move, they tell people, oh, I have an apartment. Are you interested in renting it? Uh, let me connect you with the landlord. Um, and that's how it's been done for over a decade. Because no one right. wants to pay the stupid realtor fee. And just for the Mike Connollys of the world, we don't want to pay it either. No one wants to pay that stupid fee. Um, but at the same time, like, I, I just find it just, you know, it's like saying you don't believe in gravity. You know, supply and demand. They're like, no, not in Cambridge. No, it just doesn't know. Supply and demand, not here. Uh, gravity works well, differently. The earth's kind of flat here where it's round elsewhere. Um, and, you know, we built 300 units yesterday, Robert. We built them, 300. We're done, right? Like, you, you don't understand the scale of the problem. And if you think rent control, I mean, we're going to, will I be alive? No, I'll be dead. In, in 40 years, when we come full circle again and say this was a terrible idea, and we actually have politicians who, you know, are able to lift us up out of this dust because quite frankly, they'll probably be in such a dire financial state they'll have to, um, you know, it, it'll be like the, you know, the, the turning of the dial, like just another, another, another cycle that we just made a huge, huge error and there'll be another massive correction. I'm, I'm in, inclined to agree with you, uh, but I will say one thing about the, the, um, the, my caution about looking at averages yeah. is that you can, you, you could say, for example, that, um, uh, and again, I'm, this is probably not true, but let's just say you say, well, you know, the biotech industry has peaked and it's going to be fading away and disappearing from here on. That's not true, by the way. No. But, but if it were true, then even if it was true on average around the state, it might still be completely untrue in Cambridge because that might just be the place where it's actually doing really, really well. Well, and you know. in, 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 in just to interject in terms of housing valuations, you saw that in 20, 2008, Cambridge stayed relatively flat, while even neighboring cities declined 15, almost 20 percent. Uh, right now, Cambridge is in a slower, slower incline. It's, it's actually relatively flat, but it has way more to do with rates because the federal government, for some antiquated backwards reason, has decided that wages and uh, you know, single family homeowners are the reason why our economy is experiencing inflation. And it's 
you know, every time the Fed ratchets is up a quarter of a point, half a point, all they're really doing is taking uh, would be first time home buyers off the market, while the rest of us who are you know, more integrated in the system, as it were, um, are just, you know, just having to navigate with a different size paddle. Um, and it's, it's unfortunate in my mind, I'm not going to you know, say that I'm an economic expert, but if you think that by ratcheting up the interest rates is going to have a significant impact on inflation, you know, I would like to sell you the mass average. Um, it's, uh, you know, five bucks, pretty cheap. Um, it's just, it's just an unfortunate uh, sort of old, old and dusty playbook that we're revisiting. Yeah. Actually, I'll, I'll just mention one other sort of paradoxical thing since I was mentioning earlier about there was this proposal. And, and by the way, there, there was this proposal again, I'll give you the, the bill number. It was um, HD 3252, an act promoting YIMBY. I actually agree with most of that proposal, you know, because it's basically talking about things like transit oriented development and, uh, and things like that. You know, so I said, I'm not going to disagree with that. You know, I think that's still sort of a but good trans thing. Transit also has to work. Did yeah. You, did, you, you see that clip of the uh, Harvard station dropping a tile on somebody the other day? Yeah, actually, you know, what's great about that particular <laughs> clip was it was a woman who I think it was a woman who was walking. Was no one got her. hurt. That was that was the great. Thing. Yeah. Like, and then this oh. this 400 pound thing just sort of drops right in front of her, like inches from her. And she stops. And I think she maybe she had her phone or something. I don't know. And she just looks. Three seconds later, she just walks around it and walks up the stairs like it was day in the park. <laughs> no, I, I would love to. I would love to talk to her, but I think in that moment she's like, "Huh, life is fleeting. <laughs> um, <laughs> every like, day, every day is a gift." <laughs> that's right. Like a, like a like a, a great that, that little philosophical like moment right in front of her. Wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but anyway, the. Uh, uh, so the thing I was going to mention, though, about that, about the IMI thing is, so they were talking about they were going to mandate that Massachusetts must produce 427,000 new housing units, yeah. of which, you know, a certain number have to be so-called affordable and then various ranges of that. This, it talked about things like, you know, uh, within a half a mile of a bus station or or a transit node, whatever, certain rules would have to apply and certainly you couldn't require parking, you couldn't do this and do that, you know. Uh, and all of that, that sounded particularly good. But then I read also in the, um, I think it was in the Boston Globe that in the latest census, the population of Massachusetts, Massachusetts had actually dropped 110,000. So I thought, okay, um, hmm. So normally you would think, well, if the population is dropping, then the demand for housing should be relieved to some degree. Right. But I believe the reason why that's not true is that for all we know, maybe everybody who was leaving was leaving from Western Mass. <laughs> <laughs> and meanwhile, and meanwhile, you know, people were still trying to like cram themselves into Cambridge, right? I, I, I don't know the answer to those questions, but I, I, you know, I saw those numbers and I was thinking the same thing too, like to some degree, like, wow, we must, um, well, the, you know, because Cambridge had to submit a letter to the state um, at the end of January, uh, explaining how our zoning code would allow for the creation of 10,000 units in the next eight years. That was part of that housing choice. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's a it's a pretty yeah. it's a pretty easy thing if you think intellect from like an academic standpoint. Yes, if I utilized all the zoning that we have here and blew it all out, yes, we could produce 10,000 units. Out. So it's a, kind of a weird question to ask, yeah. but. I I didn't actually read the submission, but it seems like to me, if, tell me if I'm wrong here, basically said, no, we're good. Uh, yeah. Basically all the proposal we've got here, we're, we're sort of okay. I think we meet all the standards. See you later. It was, right. it was an eight page uh, report and I read it and it was exact, I mean, I don't, it was paraphrasing itself. So in the, the responses were yes, no, yes, we got it. Uh, no, I think someone drew in a double thumbs up. Um, that, that was like the, the depth of the report. Right. You know, and I think that would be the exactly the appropriate report to make, right? quite yeah. honestly, because I think we've probably been, you know, we've been to whatever degree the word progressive has any meaning at all. We've been it everything doesn't. they would ever hope for, I would imagine, in terms of, you know, allowing certain things and promoting housing growth and developing affordable housing and everything that everybody says they think is good. But, you know, we, so I don't think we are we would be in violation of, of a, any new policy. But but anyway, the, the only the 
primary point I was really simply going to make is that even if on average there was a population drop in Massachusetts, you cannot infer from that that the demand in Cambridge has necessarily gone down as well. It may have gone up, but you know, uh, but uh, anyway, it's another matter. You know, actually one thing, again, I, I could go off on many directions in, in here, but you know, one of the things that strikes me uh, when they talk about, you know, when people, I've actually there's making reference to things like displacement. And I kept, you know, maybe because I've been spending a lot of time looking at the city charter and some of the city's history, you know, is that, you know, back in 1846, when we became a city, we had 12,000 people in the city. By the end of the 19th century, we we're up at, you know, we we're at 90,000 or so, somewhere in that range. And the, the nature of the population kept changing. The industrial, the industrial revolution certainly, you know, took root here. And we had a lot of people in the labor force, a lot of factory workers and whatever. And then the, you know, the, the nature of Cambridge changed. And now we have much more, you know, the educational institutes, institutions have definitely had a big effect on this. And the, 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 the kind of people who are moving here are to some degree a match to the, uh, the local economy now. Now people can complain about displacement and I think we should be taking steps to try and make life easier for people who were born and raised here so that they're not getting booted out so easily. But also we have to acknowledge the fact that the city is changing just as it has always changed. Yeah. You know, and you can't just freeze us in amber and say, this is what it is. And we have to pass laws to stop the movement of people because people are going to move well, here. People are going to move out. And that's just reality. Displacement is not going to be changed by rent control. You look at the hit fast history of it. You know, the only thing that's going to help with displacement is the mass production of housing. And you say, well, we can't fit it in Cambridge. Okay, fine. We can build it in other municipalities, other places. Um, you know, Cambridge, I've always said Cambridge has lots and lots of land. There just happens to be things on it. Um, this, this is true. By the way, um, we're going we're gonna to have to wind it down, unfortunately. Never. We'll have, we'll have to do this again sometime, I think. Yeah, yeah maybe. So, all right. So anyway, on that fabulous note. Uh, so this has been another fabulous edition of Cambridge Inside Out. And we'll see you again soon. See ya.